Okay, hello. Um, my name is Rogier and I understand that not everybody here. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Internet. Zeg maar ja. Ja. Okay. Hello, my name is uh, Rogier and I understood that not everybody here speaks uh, Dutch, so I'm going to do the talk in, uh, in English. If there are any questions in Dutch or something that you don't understand, just shout. I don't like the. We do the questions afterwards because you get you have to remember all everything all the time. So um, I work at the Botanical Garden of Leiden, uh, where I am the um, uh, the head of the the, the greenhouse departments. Uh, I work there now for about 12 years, and um, yeah, we grow a lot of pretty rare plants. Some some of the plants are actually the only known example of their kind that are still uh, alive. Um, and from my sort of professional point of view, uh, I've been watching the plant hype with a lot of, uh, well, it was very funny to watch because you see things come um, and it's very nice to see the resemblance with things that happened in the past. So I'm going to take you on a sort of tour uh, through plant hypes and then also maybe have a look at possible plant hypes of the future. <coughs> Let's see how it works. Yeah? Okay, it's a touch. Well, a very famous plant hype, especially here in the Netherlands, was the tulip mania. Um, the tulip mania is pretty similar to what happened to the aeroids. Tulips became very popular, they were fancy, they were new. You had odd varieties like the striped ones mm -hmm. that you see on both uh, pictures. This is actually a tulip schoon. it's a variety from 16, I don't know, like somewhere in the 1600s. So this is one of the tulips that actually has witnessed the tulip mania. Um, but what happened is that people invested a lot of money in these plants, and then afterwards it turned out that these plants were actually not as I wish that I That's history, man. So everybody, like everybody now knows who he is. You're on video, baby. <laughs> but um, so uh, pe people invested a lot of money getting these plants. They were worth as much as some houses even. Uh, but then it turned out that it was well, not something very durable, and then the price collapsed, and people sold bulbs before they actually had them, and you get this weird stock market type system where people invested money that wasn't there, and the bulbs were not there, so the whole thing collapsed, and something similar happens to the variegated plants that we grow now. So you see on social media a lot of people that are frustrated, they bought a very expensive plant, and now after a few years, they have plenty of cuttings to sell, and suddenly the plant is not so valuable anymore. But that's what happens. That's a good, I think it's a good thing about plants. Um, but yeah, if we go to the east, to Japan, Korea, and China, you have the Fukidan. Uh, these are very interesting. These are small orchids um, that normally have plain green leaves. Uh, some have variegated leaves like this one. And these plants, the plant hype was very connected to status. So only the, the um, uh, samurai and the, yeah, the people of status were allowed to grow these plants. Um, and that's, that's why they were called fukidan. It meant noble or like a rich orchid. The normal varieties with the white flowers and the green leaves were fudan, wind orchid, because they grow on tree branches and the wind always sweeps to the, through the roots of these plants. Uh, they were common, everybody could grow them, but the selected varieties were very special. And even today, uh, you can find um, mutations of these forms which are more valuable than an average car. And when I was in Japan, the, the weird thing about the Japanese culture is that they, they have uh, immense respect for other people, their property. So if you go to a nursery and you have a small plant like this, this on the table, I had one, I picked it up because I liked it. And I asked my Japanese friend how much it was, and it was a plant of 30,000 euros, more or less. And it was just there on the table because no one steals it, which I found was like, this is so refreshing. Uh, but here you see some uh, flower mutations. So beside the variegated leaf forms, you also have forms, is there no light? Uh, some leaf forms which have, uh, some plant forms which have flower mutations. So. Up in the corner you see the normal form, next to them uh, you see a green form, a two-linked form, uh, one that has two spurs, it's the same one, a yellow form, a form that has no lip, the normal petal, and 
like um, a, a filled flower form. And then besides orchids, you have hepatica. Uh, nowadays they are called uh, anemone. And also these plants were highly sought after in the different varieties. So this is all the same species. This is the ver variation within that plant. Uh, if you go to Europe, you got the snowdrop fever, which was very interesting. And this is something that still goes on, but it goes completely parallel to the general plant hype. I think most people here have never heard of snowdrop fever, and most people that are into snowdrop fever have never heard of the aeroid uh, craze. Uh, but again, here you see all different varieties of one single species of snowdrop, the Galantis nivalis. And some of these forms, they go well up a thousand euros for one single bulb. So when they have a new variety, they place it on eBay, and you, you see the exact thing going on with aeroids, that uh, when you have more enthusiasts than you have bulbs available, uh, the prices can go skyrocket. It's not as crazy as, for example, uh, Philodendron Spiritus Sancti, which, which goes for multiple tens of thousands of euros. Uh, but still, for a small bulb this size, 1,800 pounds, so that's uh, well, almost 2,000 euros, it's pretty new. Yeah, pretty impressive. Well, and then you get the aeroids. So this is a thing that started shortly before the pandemic, and I think the pandemic really helped uh, this group to be uh, to become so popular as it is. Um, I've been collecting plants since I was, I don't know, maybe even since I was about five or. Uh, but tropical plants from a later age, but I, I never had a crush on aeroids. I don't know why. Uh, but when I got Corona myself, I was also at home, sick, I got long COVID, so I couldn't do anything. And at home, my, my plants that I kept at home were succulents and orchids. They are nice, but not when, when you're home all day and want to see something happening. And aeroids are fantastic. So I got some from the hortus, some aeroids, some seeds of anthuriums. I bought a terrarium and I started growing these aeroids in the terrarium. And like every two days, you could see progress. This, this was something I wasn't used to plants for myself. So I think this is one of the key reasons why aeroids became so popular. So they are easy to take care of. They are rewarding, they grow really fast. And what really helped was again, this trigger of plants being very expensive. There's something uh, that, that is about a plant that um, if it becomes ridiculously expensive, it's something interesting to talk about, to show your family. Look at this plant. Like, look, I don't have a stupid hobby. Look, other people pay 2,000 euros for this cutting. Look, I, like, I'm not weird. They are. And exactly, you, you do exactly the same thing. And this, all these things helped the airway bubble, which you see at the moment. Now the pandemic is slowly coming to an end. People are going to work again. People. Um, are going on holiday again and suddenly these fast growing plants are pretty demanding in a house because they need more care and if you go away from your house for two weeks you have to find someone who can take care of these plants well something else about the aeroid uh, hype which uh, was very noticeable in the hortus it's more about the photo on the on the left so there was a philodendron hastatum and growing between it was a, a philodendron polyporoides uh, it was a cutting I got from a friend from uh, Madeira and like I said I had nothing special with these aeroids so I thought okay just grow it against there but it was in the public part of the, the greenhouse and suddenly I noticed that the whole bottom part of the plant was cut off and someone was organized because it was a clean cut so someone came to the botanical garden with a knife so I thought okay well it happens more often that people steal cuttings but okay um, and then a month later, more or less, the whole top part was cut off. This is weird. This is not a special plant. So I asked around, and it turned out that that time, Philodendron polyporoides was about a thousand euros for cutting. Okay. So I never experienced in my life, because we have several closed sections at the botanical garden where the public is not allowed to come, and usually we reserve them for orchids, very fancy, very expensive carnivorous plants, things like that. But for the, for the first time in history, we had to move house plants to the closed section, which was very strange. And by now, we can slowly move them out the closed section again. So, for example, Philodendron gloriosum is at the moment more affordable. 
or affordable to a point that people do not feel the urge to steal them from a botanical garden and we can now plant them uh, back in the public houses again. But there are so many more aeroids. This, for example, is a very important one for our botanical garden. This is Amorpophallus titan. This is uh, the aeroid with the largest inflorescence and this is always a spectacle. When this one flowers, it attracts thousands of people. Uh, last year we had a smaller flowering species, which was rarer, um, but we, we received several thousands of visitors on one single day, just that, just that wanted to see the flower and smell it. But this, of course, is a plant that people cannot grow at home. People try. Uh, seeds of these plants are often wild collected uh, because logically there are no producers of seeds of this plant because it's so large. So they are collected in the wild and then they are bought by people that have no greenhouse, just a terrarium or a windowsill. And of course these plants have no future at all, but they just sold them because it's interesting. And sometimes they, they are offered to us if we want to, uh, to have them, but we already have about nine at the moment. So as you can see, they are quite yeah, big. So we say no, but um, for people that really love Amorphophallus, there are also small species. So this, for example, is uh, Amorphophallus uh, musaculi, and he is growing a lot of them at the moment. So if you want to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this. Well, this is probably about the smallest species. Yeah, I like this. That could focus, focus closely. <laughs> uh, but this is about the smallest species of Amorphophallus uh, that you can grow. The funny thing is about this one, because we have a botanical garden, this one grows better on the windowsill than in the greenhouse. It somehow hates high humidity. So when we grow them in the greenhouse, they always suffer a little bit. A plant like this has grown on my windowsill and it grows just fine. And you plant one tuber, and you will harvest one large new big tuber and about 10 or 20 baby ones, which in three years will be mature. So they are very nice to uh, spread around eventually. And then you got these type of aeroids, which are now getting more popular, and you can notice because they are quite expensive. Uh, Uliarum and Nephitis, for, ex uh, Nephitis for example. Uh, this is an, um, a Nephitis, and the ones up there in the corner are Uliarums. Um, and I noticed they are sometimes available. These are nice, easy to grow uh, aeroids. Uh, but they are slow and I think that's the reason why they remain even though they have been in the trade for quite a while they remain expensive um, interesting about Julianum is that you can grow them from leaf cuttings and uh, Nephthitis you can well you can just split the rhizome or harvest seeds they are quite easy to propagate but it, it takes time and for the people that are sick of growing plants indoors there are plenty of very pretty aeroids that you can grow outside. This for example is Helicodicerus, they are flowering at the moment. Um, as you can see I photographed my fingers with them, the flowers are, are huge and they smell like a dead animal. So if you have them in flower you usually notice like, okay it's flowering at the moment it, and it's, they call them dead horse arum but it's more fishy. It's like they have uh, clam shells or something that, that you leave in a bowl in the sun. That's the sort of fragrance that it gets. Um, and these plants are very impressive, and with, this, with the scent they have, it's better that you grow them outside. <laughs> and then you get uh, the begonias. I said it's collecting plants the frustrating way, because begonias are easy to grow, but they're also easy to kill. Um, these are the type of plants I'm going on holiday soon, and these are the plants that make me nervous because usually I have a, I have a few terrariums in which I grow to, uh, begonia and I can say that I water them once a month, that's it. But the thing is when something goes wrong, you have to be there straight away. You cannot <coughs> wait a few days. If that happens with begonias and you're on holiday, uh, well, your plant is gone and if it starts melting and it covers another plant, it will take the other plant as well. And then before you know it, your whole terrarium with begonias is, is gone. Uh, luckily, they are very easy to propagate, so some are still pretty pricey, um, but the ones that are in cultivation, I think they will be in cultivation for a while, and they will eventually get cheaper, and they are easy to, uh, to share with your friends. This is, for example, Begonia dracopelta, um, which is one of, I find it a very easy species, and either from leaf cuttings or stem cuttings or seeds, uh, I, I tried all, and it grows very easily. So yeah, and there are more species that we 
don't grow yet this for example I don't even know what begonia this is I photographed this somewhere in, in Africa and uh, so I don't know the name but it's quite a pretty species begonia is a huge genus uh, they grow in almost every tropical country of the world so that's why there's a lot to discover so begonias is a very nice group if you are uh, uh, you know a little bit tired of aeroids begonias is a very nice group to to jump into and you can see that this is uh, that this is happening well especially for you oh yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah collecting plants the retro the retro way because uh, funny with Hoyas that they were already quite popular in the 80s and 90s and then we forgot about them and now they are back but the thing is is that somehow these old collections survived in like in secret corners and, and greenhouses of old people and now all these plants that you can find back are from old stock that was that was already available in Europe uh, since a long time very different than many of the aeroids which were quite recently imported, especially from Ecuador and, and South American countries and later also Asia. But many of the Hoyas were around. And I know from the Botanical Garden where, where I work, we have a very large Hoya collection. And um, yeah, I know from this collection also some cuttings were shared to nurseries. And from the nurseries, they come back to the, to, to the Botanical Garden. And this is super important. With plants, there's one key thing you always have to remember. Sharing is keeping. If you have a special plant and you think, oh, this is mine, I don't want to share it, that's the best way to lose a plant. Because if it dies, it's gone and you will never find it again. So that's why with plants, if you share them and for whatever reason you lose your plant, you'll always have someone to get the cutting back. And this is true for private people, but this is also true for botanical gardens. So even in our botanical garden, we currently grow species that we still have because once in the past we gave them to collectors and something happened in the greenhouse and, and they died and we got them back from the from the collector which is very yeah very good now collecting plants the fancy way you do of course with orchids orchids have been uh, popular since the Victorian uh, times uh, but orchids are always have always been sort of a niche plant it's a certain type of person and that's why I don't expect orchids to become generally very uh, popular because they are first of all quite expensive to purchase of course are cheaper ones but you have the same with aeroids uh, they are slow growing uh, and they are generally more difficult the problem with an orchid because they are often slow growing it takes a long time before you notice you're doing something wrong and by the time you finally notice you're doing something wrong it takes a long time to get the orchid over you know the, the the dip again but then again you see that orchids are getting more and more popular and i think they really deserve that if you take for example the genus bulbophyllum which is one of the largest um, orchid genera there is so many variation and you see that within the orchid community uh, bulbophyllum are very um, uh, popular there's one exception is the jewel orchids uh, they are very popular at the moment because they are so similar to the leafy arrows you see that the focus of plant collectors at the moment is leaves, not flowers. I think this will change, but at the moment it's still foliage. Hoyas yeah. have both. What? Hoyas have both. Hoyas, are, wow. but Hoyas are messy. Um, I'm not a fan of Hoya. <laughs> uh, and then you have Lepantis, <laughs> which are... Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Lepantas are also getting popular because people are um, having terrariums and Lepantas are tiny orchids that require high humidity and if you have a, 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 a nice running terrarium these are very nice to collect because first of all they are uh, spectacular to look at but also um, you can have many in a small space and this is a thing which is the rarest thing in all collectors collection that space so if you start collecting small things you can keep on collecting longer this is my uh, sort of uh, botanical fetish. This is uh, Coribas. These are also orchids. They are tiny, uh, tiny terrestrial orchids. And they, they combine weird, almost carnivorous plant looking flowers with leaves that could not, that would not look bad on an anthurium. So they have everything. So yeah, they, they are tricky to grow, uh, but we're now studying them and slowly spreading them. So I think one day these will be widely available and probably pretty popular but at the moment they are as, as one says rare as hen's teeth um, but yeah
And then there is collecting plants, the geeky style, carnivorous plants. Um, if you go to different plant events, for example this one, I see a lot of women. Aeroids, I don't know why, but there's a thing. If you go to a fair or of uh, carnivorous plants, you usually only see men. They're usually all single. <laughs> uh, look, look like the type that would be like a computer nerd or something like that. That's the type of person that. Of course, there are exceptions. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> you like you like carnivorous plants, huh? I have terrarium now. Okay, well, there some carnivorous plants do 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 well, but there is a group. Same with, for example, uh, orchids. It's very often old people. Um, cactus is very usually old men. It's very like if you go to it, just do it for fun. It's very fun to see. But carnivorous plants, um, they are nice because if you look beside their beauty, they are very interesting. They eat they eat meat, which is unusual for a plant. But even if you look at the the family tree of plants, what is very interesting is that all the the carnivorous plants are not related to each other. So you would think like you have a group, like you have aeroids, and that's the carnivorous plants. No, carnivorous plants are found all over the family tree of, uh, of plants in general. So for example, um, well I'll show you later the, the, the salicenia. The salicenia is closely related to a kiwi fruit than it is to a nepenthes, even though both nepenthes and salicenia are pitcher plants. <coughs> I will show you what they look like. So these are salicenia. And these are, well, dis distantly related to kiwi fruit, but not to uh, other uh, carnivorous plants. This is a cephalotus, another pitcher plant. These are related to oxalis, the, the little clover-like plants, like also distantly, but more related to oxalis than to other carnivorous plants. And then you have the nepenthes, and they are, funnily enough, uh, related to, for example, the Venus flytraps and the Drosera. So they are related to carnivorous plants, but not the ones that you would expect. These are, I think, Nepenthes are very collectible, uh, but they are difficult because they require very high humidity. So for people with terrariums, these are nice. And then again, I'm holding here a picture of uh, Nepenthes etwartsiana. The picture is this big. And then the plant that is attached to it is 10 meters. And then the plant, if you talk about high plant prices, seedlings this size are 200 euros. And the plant needs to be this, this wide to form pictures that size. So that these are expensive, but also Nepenthes hamata, for example, the one on the right with the black teeth, is also one we cannot grow in the public part of the greenhouse because it will get stolen straight away. It's very expensive, as you can see, because it's a beautiful species. But, uh, but the thing is, these have always been expensive. This is not a hype. These were expensive from the moment they were discovered, and they still are. This is a super hip carnivorous plant because it's vegetarian. <laughs> not, yeah, no, it's not vegan. Uh, it's vegetarian because it makes these little balls with water, and the larvae of mosquitoes, they will transform the, the leaves they collect into nutrients that the plants can absorb. So if they would generally eat leaves, they would be vegan, but since they need the mosquito larvae, they are vegetarian. <laughs> Again, very pretty plant. The stem that is attached to this plant to make these pretty pictures is several meters long. I made this mistake the first time I bought this one because I saw the pictures of these nice clumps of pictures on the ground and I thought, oh, that, that would look so nice in a, in a pot. And then I bought it and I got this weird twig in the pot with no pictures at all. So I wondered like, what's going on? And the, the, the nursery man said, yeah, you have to grow it for like a, a long, for a while, and then when it's old enough, it will make a few pictures at the bottom. But never cut off the stem because, yeah, you will not get pictures as well. Now these are vegan. This one is very hardcore. This is a, a dollar cuscuta, and these plants are parasites. So this one is trying to eat barbed wire, um, <laughs> which is not working. But we'll find out later. Uh, but there are a few plants which are um, parasites which you can grow. Um, I once did a post on Instagram about this one and I was thought like, oh, this, this is too awkward for people, people will not like it. And it went crazy, so I thought, okay, people apparently like this. But this is how I sow it. So I, I smear a seed on a, a host plant, which is a succulent, a euphorbia, and then the glue dries out. And then you will get this little root that, that, that comes out. 
And then after a while, it forms this weird sucker. It's called the haustorium. And then from the center of this haustorium, it will make a twig that grows, that enters the host plant. And from that moment, it grows inside the succulent. And then, uh, like a year later, the skin of the host plant starts to burst open in different spots. And little green buds will come out. You could make a horror movie about this one. <laughs> And then you get small flowers, and then when you pollinate them, uh, which is a, a, a tricky thing to do because the flowers are so tiny, but you get these red berries. And these look very pretty. Sometimes I have plants that were covered in these red berries, and they, they make these, these succulents look very uh, pretty. So I think there could be an, a market value here uh, if people that grow these succulents would infect them with the parasite, and suddenly they would be covered in red berries, which I think would be very attractive. Um, but if you have one of these red berries, you squeeze it, a sticky seed comes out, and the whole story starts over again. This is a very interesting thing to do, not necessarily one of the prettiest plants you can grow on the windowsill, but I think it's pretty cool. Well, and then you have the succulents and the cacti. Uh, plant grow collecting the practical way, and I think there is a future for these. A lot of people are, think like, no, no, not cacti, no, no. No, you will. Just wait. Ah. Well, even you know. No, because eventually, when you start to discover that in every plant group there are species which are fascinating and beautiful, um, you'll eventually start to like them. And the more you progress with your aeroids, you, you'll start to notice that they will cost a lot of time. And eventually, you have seen all the plants because, let's face it, when you buy a plant, that's when it's you know, the nicest, and over the years it will, you get used to it. Um, having succulents is just making life easier for you. If you want to go on a holiday for a month or, you know, whatever, half a year, you can do that with succulents, because they will still, like, still love you when you come back. Okay. And some are really, uh, really spectacular, like for example, this uh, Iodium nobile. Um, just the color of it and the whole thing, it's, it's spectacular. I think the trigger, uh, with, with these hypes is a sort of social acceptance. If some of the major influencers start sharing these plants and pretend they are spectacular, then everybody wants them. And I think that's so, something so weird. Uh, I see that happening with the aeroids because before that, uh, the orchid importers from uh, Ecuador, for example, they used the aeroids to stuff their boxes. So when they came to Europe, so that's for example like 10 years ago when they came to Europe, they used Alturium and Philodendron to stuff the boxes, and then when they, they were at the, the, the orchid exhibitions, the Alturiums and Philodendrons were loaded, and they were sold for very little money because no one was interested in them. So you cannot defend the fact that these, they are beautiful, but you cannot defend the fact that these plants have always been as beautiful as they are now. There is just a sort of a hype going on. And I think every single plant group, which is at least a little bit decorative, can fall into this, this hype. So maybe succulents one day will happen. Especially the, the carrion flowers, the stapelids, could be very popular because, again, they are small. If you have a windowsill, you can grow many at a small spot. And they are very, um, I said, like they, they, they do very well in pictures. So these are very Instagrammable. Very important. <laughs> Orbea albo castanea, for example. It, the flower is only this big, but if you have a macro lens, this picture on Instagram goes wild. Everybody thinks, like, what the hell is that? But it's, it's, a, it's a succulent plant, and it, it's fantastic. This, for example, is sort of the Anturium barocianum amongst the, 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 the succulents. This is a plant that everybody wants, quite expensive, um, and it's indeed, it is spectacular. But on your windowsill, it's easy to grow, if you can get hold of one. So they're, they're easy, difficult to get, but not difficult to grow. And just some like more variation Ooh. within this group. This is a very interesting group. Uh, what is interesting about them as well is that they are related to Hoya. If you look at the center of the flower, they have the same type of structure. These basically are succulent Hoyas. So Hoyas without the leaves that became really compact. They make the same type of fruits as well. And also when you... Um, um, yeah, poke them with, with a needle, uh, some often like sap comes out, some species whitish, not as white as with Hoya, um, but you can see they are related. 
from the same group are these, the Seropedia. They grow more like Hoyas, they are climbers, um, but they are closely related to the Stabelids that I showed before. Uh, botanists even lumped them all in one big genus, but these are fantastic. If, if, if you grow these, everybody that sees them goes wild. They think these are flowers from another planet, and yet they are easy to grow. Why are they not here? Because people are not demanding them, people are not wanting them. And people, the growers grow what the people want. So they, they are available if you look for them. And then you have these, these uh, the Haworthia. Um, yeah, I find them very spectacular uh, because I have a lot of them on the windowsill and when the sun starts setting, you get this effect that the sun goes through all the tops of the leaves. And these are always uh, uh, popular. Also, like on social media, if you post them, people go go crazy for them. They are easy to grow. Um, I have I well, I'm now bullying them at the moment to see how far they can go. Uh, a few years ago, I had a few that were so that they were suffering from mealybugs so badly that I placed them outside and I forgot to bring them inside for the winter, and they got frosted, rain and frosted. And after a few months, I came across them. The pots tumbled over, and they were still alive. And they were not just alive, they looked better than all the ones that I had indoors. So from this moment on, I'm growing most of them outside even in the winter. Um, and the other, the next thing I'm testing is how long can you kill them before they actually die? I took a few out of the pot. I, I just like bare root in another pot. And they are out of the soil for over a year. And they're still happy. Well, happy is maybe a big word, but they're still alive. And if I put them up soon, they will be sprout again. So this, this is like, if you really are to the point, like I don't want to collect plants anymore because they are too time consuming, wait before you completely stop, start growing these. And when it comes to space, I love like miniature plants. It doesn't matter from which group. Here we have a succulent, here we have an orchid, and the berry on the bottom is a blueberry. So you know how small they are. So these are miniature orchids. So you could literally grow a thousand orchids in a terrarium this size. But mind you that an orchid that size is just as expensive as a big one. So you have to pay probably 25 euros for a small one. But you know, you can, you can keep on collecting. And also the Coribas that I showed you earlier are super tiny. So I grow mine in small pots in Ziploc bags. Because this way I have to water them, I think, three times a year. That's the amount of time. I'm a very bad houseplant grower because every day I go to work, I have to take care of plants. So when I'm at home, I don't want to take care of plants. So I have succulents, uh, which I ignore most of the time. And these orchids in plastic bags, which just thrive uh, without my care. And that's perfect. And then my current crush are these. The monanthus. These are small succulent plants from the Canary Islands. And the benefit about these plants is they are miniature plants, but they can grow really well in a house atmosphere. The other ones I showed you require very high humidity, the, the miniature plants. So you can grow them either in a Ziploc bag or in a terrarium, but the monanthus you can grow on the windowsill. And it looks really neat to have a windowsill with 25 tiny pots on a small row. So here you see a teaspoon to give you an idea about the size of this plant. This whole plant is this big. And Monantis is also, it's a very undiscovered group of uh, plants. There are a few species available. The one that I showed in the previous um, uh, slide is pretty commonly available. But when you buy it, you often buy it in a pot this size and then it's loaded with little plants and it looks like an ordinary succulent. So you have to know what it is, tear it apart, plant it in tiny pots, and then you have this effect. This is a uh, probably uh, Monantis brachycarus, but I'm not sure. But as you can see how small it is, also very tiny, tiny plant. And this is a, a species which is recently discovered. And when it comes to the leaf structure, I think this is one of the most spectacular ones. But this one is not yet in general cultivation, but I hope it will be. And then, yeah, I think it might end up into the next plant hype. That's it. <laughs> Ik denk dat dit half een hour. 34 minuten. If there are questions, shout. But uh, I will be around here as well. Are there any online questions? People have no, I'm just filming. I'm not live. Oh, you're just filming. You told me to. So you